Welcome to the University of Michigan Dentistry Podcast Series, promoting oral health care worldwide. We came to the rather gloomy conclusion that nutrition in the old time sense, that is nutrition as it includes such things as calcium, vitamins, minerals, and whatnot, had little, if any, effect on dental caries so far as the available population evidence was concerned. <clears throat> and I came very close, perhaps I fell into the trap, of making a statement which was true not too many years ago, that no known, known nutrient had any effect on dental caries. <clears throat> We ended on a very gloomy note. I hope none of you were discouraged enough to go out and get jobs uh, punching sodas or working as a checkout clerk. But nonetheless, it was and is true that dental caries is one of the most stubborn, most persistent, most difficult to manage of any disease which comes readily to mind. <clears throat> if I do something for you today which inhibits the progress or the initiation of a carious lesion today, there is no earnest whatsoever that this thing will continue to work tomorrow. So that we, if we are going to control dental caries, must have something which is not only effective but persistent. I say that particular statement, though, about no known nutrient, true as it was, say, 20 years ago, had to be amended when the Food and Nutrition Board finally decided that fluoride was an essential nutrient. And when we go to the point of considering the influence of the fluoride ion on dental caries in population groups, the song immediately becomes cheerful. <clears throat> Our sense of gloom is dissipated to some extent. <clears throat> and we have the feeling that finally we are accomplishing something which really will do something to lessen the need for chair-side dental treatment so far as dental caries is concerned. Now, use of the fluoride ion is one of the triumphs of epidemiological study. The idea was conceived as a result of observations in the field, its use as a community mass preventive was developed with the study of people where they lived, and by and large, the laboratory people, even up to today, have given us rather little in terms of the rationale of the action of fluoride as it opposes dental caries. There is a great deal of speculation in this regard, which is interesting at a cocktail party perhaps, but today I'd rather stick to facts and to flesh out, to add footnotes perhaps to the readings that you have been doing in the past week as a result of Dr. Graves' assignments. <clears throat> Were we to rewrite Young and Stripler today, I think there are at least two references, three perhaps, that would be added. One of these is a little book by Frank J. McClure called Water Fluoridation, The Search and the Victory. It may or may not be in your library. I'd like to have that one back since it's an autographed copy. <clears throat> there you will find in great detail a description of the way this thing was developed, the way it came about. What I would like to do at this point is give you some of the human sidelights that don't necessarily come out in McClure's book or in Young and Striffler. Starting, of course, with a man named Eager, a public health service physician assigned to Naples 
in 1901 at the time of an outbreak there, which led the public health service to intensify its quarantine efforts. And while he was stationed in that area, Eager wrote a letter back to his superior describing a thing that he called dentiscriti, dental writing. This was a peculiar affection which occurred in the, usually the anterior, the maxillary incisors of children who lived elsewhere in Italy but came to the Naples area to spend perhaps two weeks of vacation during the summer. And the typical lesion of dentiscriti was a little black line composed of black dots which usually crossed the crown of the tooth from right to left in such a manner that it looked a little bit as though someone had been trying to write on the tooth with a very soft lead pencil. Nothing much came of this letter, but it must be mentioned at this point because this, I think, is the first time we in the United States were ever concerned, at least in print, with this lesion of dental enamel, which we have since come to call dental fluorosis. The story, though, at least the part of the story that I enjoy telling, really starts with a man named Frederick McKay. Frederick McKay. Every once in a while, I've gone out to an audience of dentists and asked how many people could recognize the name of Frederick McKay. It's not at all unusual to find nobody in an audience of hundreds who can bring this man back to memory, to mind. And this is a shame because McKay is truly, I think, one of the giants in dental history. One of the men that we in dentistry can be proud of. And his story, which is detailed in Dr. McClure's book, really starts when he went to Colorado Springs, Colorado, to practice dentistry. And when he became interested, in fact, obsessed almost, with this peculiar lesion of dental enamel, which was then called Colorado Brown Stain. If we may have the first slide, this is an example of the thing that McKay was talking about. The thing that McKay was looking at, the thing that McKay was concerned about, the thing that excited McKay's cat curiosity, which parenthetically I think is one of the things that keeps a dental epidemiologist going back time and again until he finds out what's associated with that. Colorado brown stain. McKay talked about this thing at great length in the El Paso County Dental Society until in 1908, 1908, McKay received what may have been the first research grant to do what he could do to find out what causes or what was associated with this particular lesion. A very generous grant from the El Paso County Society of $200. Of course, they thought better of it and took $100 of it back at the next meeting, but uh, at least this open-handed liberal support was given to McKay, who went about the business of finding out what this was all about. And McKay very quickly established his reputation as being an utter idiot. Why should anybody be concerned with a thing like that? Stain, oh yes, it's unsightly, but then most people have it. It's easily removed. Doesn't hurt anybody. Why not uh, go to work and do some study, some research on something important like dental caries? 
And here again we have the genesis of an outstanding scientific accomplishment which began as an abstract study of something that didn't count, which happens so frequently in research. But at any rate, McKay went out to describe the natural history of Colorado brown stain. And he soon found, as you can read, that the thing was not confined to the area around Colorado Springs or even to the Rocky Mountains. Out of his own pocket, because that $100 uh, it was more then than today, but it still didn't go too far. Out of his own pocket, McKay traveled east and west. He went as far east as Naples, in fact, once he became aware of Eager's communication. He traveled extensively, and to bring a long and rather interesting story down to something manageable in a few minutes, he soon established these facts. Colorado brown stain tended to be isolated to certain communities. It tended to affect only people who had come to these communities as babes in arms or more probably been born there and who had lived there at least the first 10 or 12 years of their lives. Sometimes the thing tended to be circumscribed within a community, and when this happened, the people who were affected by this were invariably people who used a single central water supply, and the people who escaped it were usually people who used some other source of domestic water. So McKay came to the conclusion that whatever the cause was, it was waterborne, which was pure, sheer idiocy. Idiocy. There were two communities, in some cases, as close as 10 miles apart, served by water which was identical in every respect that could be detected in the early 1900s. Gram for gram, part per million, part for part per million. Yet fluorosis occurred in the one and not in the other. It was stupid. It was utterly incomprehensible that any intelligent person would ascribe this thing to something carried in the domestic water. But by a process of elimination, and we described last time, the way an epidemiologist works to eliminate these things, which are really not concerned with the disease or phenomenon under study, by a process of elimination, McKay could come to no other conclusion than that the causative factor was waterborne. So he used to go up and down these United States advising concerned mothers in an area where this was a problem to find some other source of domestic water for their children. And in my time in the health department in the state of South Dakota, we used to go up to Britain, South Dakota, Britain, and there at what was called the church well, we'd see a lineup of youngsters with coaster wagons and milk cans coming up to this well and this Methodist church lot to pump out water to take home for domestic use because McKay had advised them to go to this from the use of the city water for drinking purposes. In fact, McKay was responsible for probably the first bond issue ever voted for a dental public health reason. McKay went to Oakley, Idaho, an endemic area, endemic that is for this thing, which was still being called something other than fluorosis, and learned that a family living about eight miles out of Oakley had children who had escaped modeling. Now this was a long time ago. 
The family had moved out, or at least the children had. McKay went to California to examine one of these siblings, found the other, I've forgotten where, and finding an absence of fluorosis, suggested to Oakley that pipes be run in eight miles from the spring that supplied that farmhouse into the city of Oakley for domestic water. And very much against the wishes of the mayor, very much against his wishes, the city council of Oakley was finally pressured to vote a bond issue of $35,000 to run this pipe out to that spring. Never underestimate the power of the PTA, which put the pressure on. Sample of two, things could have changed in the interim. The mayor of Oakley at the conclusion of this city council meeting told McKay, who was present, okay, we've voted your bond issue, we're going to do this. But if after we do this, children are born and develop teeth with this staining, we'll hang you. And this was Idaho. Hanging was not uncommon in Idaho in those days. This could have happened. But fortunately, about the time that children born after Oakley voted the bonds and got the piping into the little village, about six years later, about the time that these youngsters would have begun to show fluorosis if it was going to happen, the roof fell in. McKay gathered a great quantity of water, about enough to fill half a barrel from each of six areas where fluorosis was endemic and sent this to a young chemist named Churchill, H.V. Churchill, who worked for the Aluminum Company of America in bauxite. And Alco was concerned because bauxite was one of the areas where children actually showed this thing in a severe form. And Churchill was playing around with a new technique, spectrographic analysis. And to his utter horror, to his utter horror, each of these samples submitted by McKay showed the presence of the fluoride band strong enough to make him conclude that each of these waters was quite heavily imbued, if that's the word, with fluoride. He didn't believe it. He asked McKay for more samples. He got the same answer. And finally, in 1931, Churchill, in a quick note, published his findings that this element, fluoride, was a constituent of at least, after the second run, eight domestic water supplies in the United States. And that was it. Now, this is one of those curious coincidences which happens so frequently in the development of knowledge. You may recall that logarithms were reported simultaneously by two mathematicians who never heard of each other some years ago, and so on and so on. In that same month, in 1931, two other people, or two other groups, simultaneously almost, came up with the conclusion that fluoride was the cause of this particularly particular affliction. And one of these was the team of Smith and Smith, husband and wife, who, basing their work on water from wells in St. David, Arizona, found that they could, in fact, produce fluorosis in the erupting incisors of rats who were fed this water and who subsequently identified the element responsible as fluoride by feeding the, the rats distilled water with fluoride added. One of the most interesting of the trio 
was a French veterinarian named Velu who was concerned with some difficulties his muttons were having. An affliction led to mal de mouton of sheep living in, Mor in Morocco and being pastured, being allowed to graze over flats, which it turned out were phosphate ridden. And whenever in nature you find phosphates, you find fluorides. Velu, by an incredible exercise of brain power that we don't have time to talk about here, finally identified fluoride as the substance which was responsible for the quick wearing away of the teeth of his poor little mouton. Three people, never heard, none ever heard of the others. In the same month, the year 1931, getting into scientific literature with the idea that fluoride ingested via water, in the case of McKay and the Smiths, as dust in Velu's situation, was responsible for this affection of teeth. And Well, if any of you can read French, you would enjoy reading Baylor's reports in the Annals of the Pasteur Institute. A friend of his named Balazé did some of the writing. But at any rate, what did this do to people concerned with the public health? Well, now a great deal was known about the toxic properties of fluoride prior to 1931. Roholm's classic work on fluorosis in cryolite workers was published 15 years earlier than that, in 1916. Fluoride was known to be a deadly poison in acute doses, a crippling element in chronic intoxication, and when the news that this horrible substance was found in domestic drinking waters hit the public health field, you can judge the reaction, consternation, dismay, and an immediate rush to find out if we have this stuff in our water, first of all, and secondly, if we do, whether it's associated with any of the ills that we're concerned about. So this is where we came in, really. And there was a very broad assault on population characteristics of individuals using a fluoride-bearing water, which included the consideration, I think, of every disease that had received as much as a name back in the 1930s and the 1940s. And a great deal of this led to the sort of thing that I warned you against last time, of saying that because people in a given area don't wear shoes and have very little dental caries, dental caries is inhibited by the wearing of shoes. So in these early reports, which were rushed into print, of course, there were all sorts of things like, uh, there's a great deal of goiter in my district and I find that we have fluoride in our water. What we now know, of course, is that uh, the great goitrous areas, the iodine deficiency goiter areas of the world are areas where fluoride generally is deficient. But at any rate, there was a very considerable amount, a very considerable amount of concern. But Fred McKay, that fine, I've got to use uh, Victorian terms, that fine noble gentleman, and he was that. Everybody liked Fred McKay and respected him. Well, I better not reminisce or you won't get home today. Uh, I was privileged at least to uh, know and to work a little bit with Fred McKay in his last years in Colorado Springs. He is one of the persons I remember with the greatest of pleasure, so I had better cut myself off here. But McKay, with his interest in things dental, 
proved himself the final idiot about 1925 when he ventured to get into print and say right out loud where anyone could hear him, it seems to me that there is no more dental caries, no more dental decay in these children with ferocious teeth than in children whose teeth seem to have perfect enamel. Now that was stupid. In 1925, everybody knew that dental caries was a calcium deficiency disease, that your teeth decayed because the enamel was imperfectly formed, and given perfect enamel, you'd never have any trouble with caries. But McKay not only made the statement and stood by it, he came out a, a year later with an even stronger statement, namely, that these youngsters in areas where fluorosis is endemic seem to have less dental caries than children in the areas around them. And he had a great deal of trouble getting anybody to believe that this thing could possibly be true. Well, again, I'm cutting things short. <clears throat> But this sort of thing, and some observations like this, aroused the interest of another of my personal heroes, a man named H. Trendley Dean, who was a dental surgeon in the U.S. Public Health Service, who had done work on Vincent's infection in World War I, and who came to the point where he was out in South Dakota as part of a team investigating the toxicology, <clears throat> the toxic reaction of animals, cows, to selenium in pasturage in certain parts of the Dakotas. Well, now Dean <clears throat> had access to something that we almost hesitate to mention <clears throat> a survey of dental caries in the United States, a WPA project in 1933. And the reason that we rarely cite this thing is that this was carried out by local dentists who wouldn't follow the quite specific directions sent out by the people who set this survey up. No, they had to do it right. So there are only six or eight populations of dentists who followed instructions. But fortunately for us at this point, South Dakota dentists were one of those groups that uh, decided not to do it right, but to do it the way the epidemiologist said. Well, Dean knew that there was a great variety in Kerry's experience in South Dakota. And weekends, while he could take off time from this team inspecting animals and whatnot in the area of Pier and west of Pier, he traveled around to some of these areas where caries was high and caries was low and looked for evidences of fluorosis in the teeth of school children on the street anyway and found that there was a very considerable correspondence a very considerable correspondence between modeling and Carrie's experience in children of what we would now call junior high school age, 12, 13, and 14. From this point on, Dean and McKay formed a team. Worked together very closely. But Dean, quite reluctantly, because he was obsessed with the idea that this is a harmful thing, his direction and his assignments were to investigate the possible adverse effects of fluoride. Reluctantly, I say, Dean set up a study of dental caries and fluoride 
which was and is one of the classic studies in epidemiology, not just dental epidemiology, epidemiology as a way to solve the problems of disease. Now, three things were necessary before this kind of study could be carried out. There had to be an index. And you're familiar from your reading with the DMF index. There had to be a micro method of determining fluoride in potable waters. And the Willard and Winters method, which involved uh, distillation, solved that problem. It was accurate down to one-tenth of a part per million. And finally, one had to find an area where fluoride in water could be presumed. Now, the study was set up for children aged 12 through 14 years. But under the thinking at that time, it was necessary to be able to go back 14 years in history and be satisfied that the water in use in this community 14 years ago actually carried fluoride and about this much. This is one of the drawbacks, remember, of the cumulative measure, such as the DMF index of dental caries. Well, by the sheerest kind of luck, we in this country have what is still today the most dependable aquifer as regards fluoride. And that is the thing called generally the Dakota sandstone, which comes as far east as Illinois, parts of Wisconsin, goes west to the Continental Divide, and which yields waters with a fluoride content so dependable that, uh, well, you know, there's, uh, it doesn't, never hurts to be, get a little reputation as a magician. Two or three times I have told somebody what they would find when they opened a, an artesian well in South Dakota that had been capped these 10 or 20 years within one part per million what the fluoride content of the water would be. That's because this aquifer is a vast reservoir of fluoride and because in South Dakota we had uh, logs of every deep well that had been drilled from time zero. This had been gotten together again as a WPA project in the 30s. And simply by looking at those logs, seeing the aquifer, the strata from which the uh, water was being taken, there was no trick at all to come up with an estimate of 2.7 parts per million. I'm thinking of Mitchell where the well actually had 2.8 when we opened it up. So here was this absolutely dependable, consistent source of a fluoride-bearing water. And since that time, in various other parts of the world, we have been puzzled, oh, by such things as finding fluorosis in children in a refugee camp in Lebanon, getting their water from the Latani River, which at that time had only three-tenths of a part per million of fluoride and so forth and so forth. You are looking at a slide of fluorosis, actually, from a child who was born and has lived all his life in Georgetown, Kentucky, with the water that uh, normally contained less than two-tenths of a part per million of fluoride. However, for six months, when this child was young, it contained 14 parts per million. One of the facts about fluoride naturally occurring is that it is not dependable, especially when surface waters are involved. And uh, it's only when we have something as dependable as the Dakota sandstone, which is called different things in different parts of the world, different parts of the, the Middle West, that we can go to this kind of determination. But Dean set up his study in the eastern edges of the Dakota sandstone in the study which is now usually referred to as the 21 cities. And if we may have the next slide. We have here a familiar graph that you have seen before. The correlation between dental caries experience 
10.8 up here at Michigan City, Indiana with no fluoride. Something a little over two over here in Colorado Springs, which is one of the exceptions. A curve that is perfect within the limitations of the laboratory methods used for the determination of fluorides of water, and certainly within chance fluctuation in the average DMF for children of these ages. Now this slide, this graph is a little bit different from the ones you have normally seen, and I've used it here because here is the same material graphed in that crude measure, the Knudsen Index, which depends only on the presence or absence of one or more DMF teeth in the mouth. You have read about this, and you have read that it is useless in most situations. In this particular case, where contrast is being made with a very low level of caries activity, I call your attention to the fact that the one index here is just as good as the other in determining the statistical significance of these differences. And here is still another example of how the very crude index, the very crude index, can be used and, in fact, was can or applied here does demonstrate the difference between a high and a low prevalence. Now, if you go back to the history of this thing, you will find that Dean paid attention to a great many other things in fluoride in the water. It was necessary, for example, at that time, to determine whether there was a corresponding difference in mean annual hours of sunshine. Mean annual hours of sunshine. It was necessary to determine whether there was a difference in hardness of water because it followed logically, at least in the minds of people who like to be theoretically rather than pragmatically oriented, it was logical that if calcium deficiency was the cause of dental caries, then people who used a hard water should have less dental caries. And the next slide is an example of the same array that you saw a moment ago, but now it's arrayed over against parts per million of calcium, that is to say, soap hardness in the water. And if you run this thing down, as I hope some of you will be curious enough to do, you're going to find that Dean eliminated systematically an array of about 20 different things having to do with community water, which failed to solve out exactly in the same way that soap hardness fails to, uh, to solve out. I stressed last session that one of the things we can depend on in epidemiological study is this negative result, that one of the most useful things about epidemiological study is its uncanny ability to get rid of rubbish, to get rid of rubbish. Get this stuff out of our thinking and out of our literature. Unfortunately, getting rid of something is never as easy as getting it into the literature. We still bow at the idol of adequate calcium and vitamin D. And one of the reasons I emphasize this sort of thing for you is that we are getting dangerously close to the point of bowing at the great idol of fluoride without stopping to consider what is the evidence for it and whether perhaps we haven't been taken again for the suckers we are. And you and I are suckers. Everybody in dentistry is a sucker for the word prevention. Let me come out and say to you, if you bleach your hair with peroxide, you will inhibit dental caries, and instantly somebody will start waving the flag, whether there's any evidence for that or not. So I think 
you and I need to be sure we are not being suckered here again in this fluoride matter. Well, now, does this thing that I've showed you prove that dental caries is inhibited by fluoride in community water? Of course not. It only shows that there is an association. And we should have been warned, and in fact, people like Dean were warned by the fact that for decades during this study, no one was able to detect fluoride in waters or any other different thing in the waters where this affection occurred. So it was going to be necessary, wasn't it, to prove that, first of all, that this was a cause and effect relationship and to investigate the possibilities of using it in a controlled manner it was necessary to try it and see. In other words, to go to the clinical trial. I hope there's no disagreement on that because I think a good half of the rubbish in the dental caries literature is due to the fact that someone has observed a relationship between this thing, call it X, and dental caries immediately jumps to the conclusion that X is the cause of dental caries and that if X is somehow removed, dental caries will cease to exist. This can never be assumed on the basis of any intellectual approach. The only way that we have found yet in what has been called this veil of tears is to try it and see. Try it and see with humans. There was still another factor involved in the situation, namely the factor of possible persistence. Now, we started today's session with the thought that any caries inhibitory agent which is going to be valuable must have some persistence that the mere fact that I do something to inhibit caries to, in your mouth or mine today does not necessarily mean that the lesion won't start tomorrow. That's why in things like plaque control, plaque removal at least every 24 hours is considered a basic from the theoretical point of view. How long does this last? And there was, in fact, some material in the literature coming from England unfortunately based on faulty fluoride determinations of waters in a, perhaps I'm wandering, uh, in chalk deposits of waters, which it was found out later, actually fluctuated up and down and back and forth. But there was an idea that even though this was true with children, the effect might be lost early in adult life. And a man named Weaver came up with the idea that fluoride in these children probably gave no more than about a five-year postponement of the onset of dental caries. So it was necessary, the next slide will, I'm sorry, I missed something of great importance. There was not only an inhibition of dental caries in these children in the 21 cities depending on the amount of fluoride in the water, but the inhibition was quite effective, not fully, but quite effective, at levels too low to produce Colorado brown stain, fluorosis. It uh, certainly, and this was one of Dean's concerns, I've heard him say this many times, it certainly would have been useless to inhibit caries and molars if by the addition of fluoride it was necessary to destroy the anterior teeth so that everybody went around looking like grandma with no teeth in their mouth. So this was a pivotal point in the development of the fluoride caries hypothesis. And the next slide. This, if you can see it, Again, this child has had 15 parts per million of fluoride for a short time, 
But this is a case of very mild fluorosis, and this is representative, at least, of the most advanced case of fluorosis I have ever seen in a community with a properly controlled fluoridation program. Some of the things you're looking at and the things you're most apt to be able to pick out, for example, this marking on the cusp of the cuspid there, is not fluorosis. That's a congenital thing which occurs regardless of fluoride in water. But this, I say, is the most advanced thing. Now, I must hasten to concede that in one southern city, which overfluoridated by about 50%, I found a couple of youngsters out of 700 or so with fluorosis more advanced than this I'm showing you. But that was, I think, faulty planning. This was one of these communities which rushed early to fluoridate its water long before the rest of the country was willing, or I'm sorry, long before the people who were studying this thing were willing to recommend it <clears throat> as a public health measure. The next slide is actually the thing that you see most frequently in children of a fluoridated community. And those of you who might get into the clinic here will see this sort of thing in children in Ann Arbor, which fluoridated its water supply about 20 years ago, 1954. This is what we found in more than two children out of five in Grand Rapids, for example, and has been described by Nevitt and Frankel, some others in a piece which appeared quite a long time ago in the Journal of the American Dental Association. It's been described by Gene Forrest in Britain. It's been described by any number of people. And this is one of the reasons why the suggestion that blind examinations be made in fluoride, non-fluoride communities is not exactly sensible. There is no way you can keep a knowledgeable dental examiner from knowing he's in a fluoride community. This is one of the things that Bradford Hill was talking about when he said that in some cases, the result of a study may be so overwhelming that it cannot be obscured by any amount of mismanagement. There is simply no way. If you could bust these youngsters in, you could do anything you like, and you still would be sure almost always. Back in World War II, when I was in the Navy, we used to get uh, examiners who were quite sure they could spot any uh, recruit from Texas. Not because he had fluorosis, but because his teeth might be carriage free and so forth and so forth. This thing works. It works. Well, it works to a degree that uh, you couldn't believe. When I came back from the Navy to get into the South Dakota Health Department, before my civilian clothes arrived, I was met by three of our old timers in the South Dakota Dental Society who said, now look, Al, we know you're one. Yeah, they piled it on a bit. But don't waste any time running down this fluoride will of the wisp. That's just a red herring. Let's get on to something that will do some good for our kids. And uh, two or three months later, just to find out what the score was in South Dakota, I asked these men to go 16 miles down the road and examine a population of kids. We got about 50 dentists into the act. These men came back and wrote me a six-page letter saying, why, yes, we in Aberdeen used to have fluoride. I remember now. Our teeth used to be the way they are down there. But now that we've gone to this surface water, our children's teeth have gone to uh, expletive deleted. And from that point on, of course, they were the ones who were pushing for fluoridation in South Dakota. It simply is beyond any, any, any. Cavill, I started to say, if that's the right word. And it comes without this alleged cost of unesthetic anterior teeth. 
going back to the, well, don't uh, I don't I'm not asking for the previous slide to be brought back, but if you can remember that and contrast that to a mouthful of discolored silicate fillings, now that our sixth and fourth graders are beginning to smoke, I think you can see it would be pretty hard to do anything that wouldn't improve actually the looks of the youngsters. And Gene Forrest, who's work in Great Britain is certainly fully corroboratory of everything I've said here. Actually believes that there's a great improvement. If you've seen British people, you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say stained silicate fillings. But back to the other question that I anticipated out of turn a few moments ago. On the duration of this effect, the next slide, if I'm with it, and I am now, is the result of perhaps the first study, first acceptable study accepted by the scientific community, of dental caries in adults. These are people in Boulder and Colorado Springs in Colorado up through the age of 44 years, quite carefully selected so that those persons included in the Boulder sample had never had a fluoride water. Those persons in Colorado Springs had had it at least through the first 14 years of life and whose absences from Colorado Springs had not been longer than, and I've forgotten the exact term. This study was carried out in 1950, shortly after the conclusion of World War II, and some of the people in this sample, some of the people in this sample were young men who had served in the armed forces during that war. But this is essentially the same magnitude of difference that was seen for corresponding levels of fluoride in the 21 studies in children aged 12 to 14 years. And to the question as to how long the onset of caries is delayed, well, we all do very silly things. I did something here that no statistician in his right mind would ever do. I extrapolated these curves. These are before the days of computer. These curves are worked out on the desk. And I found out, yes, it's true. If these curves are mean anything, people in Boulder will actually catch up with people of, or people of, people of Colorado Springs, I mean will actually have just as many decayed, missing, and filled permanent teeth as people in Boulder about the time they reach the age of 330 years. It's a perfectly legitimate way to look at the effectiveness of a preventive agent. But so far as I'm aware, nobody in uh, Colorado Springs has attained that age yet. Now we've same story, of course, is told to the next slide. Unfortunately, not to the same scale in the difference of decayed, missing, and filled surfaces. But we found something here which nowadays seems more significant than it did at that time. Namely, that there seemed to be a selective effect of fluoride on caries. Fluoride seemed to be a great deal more effective on smooth surface carries, in the inhibition, that is, of smooth surface carries, than it was in the inhibition of carries in pits and fissures. And the next slide is a rundown of the difference in approximal surface carries between Boulder and Colorado Springs, starting with the center and going toward the end. A, a phenomenon probably more readily absorbed in terms of the next slide, which shows the percentage of difference between approximal surfaces like this one. This is an approximal area, including the mesial of both central incisors and the mandible and the maxillary. And you can see that there was a definite difference in favor of anterior teeth which is lost to some extent as one goes back toward the distal of the second molar 
where the difference was only approximately 80% in the mandible and 60% in the maxilla. Things of this sort get to be suggestive. And a great deal of what seems to be true about the caries in, or, uh, initiating potential of Streptococcus mutans seems to fall exactly in this area here. It is quite possible that fluoride is more effective against that particular strain of organism than against uh, the things which do not require, or the areas that don't require the kind of protection that plaque gives in the pits and fissures, in the lesion after cavitation has begun. Now this all seems very theoretical, but the next slide, I think, shows you what the payoff can be. This is one of several showing tooth mortality rates in Boulder and in Colorado Springs. And it illustrates several things. Namely, that people with a less education, those with, who had completed only eight years of school or less, were much more prone in both cities to lose teeth. But that the payoff in terms of teeth lost was substantially pretty much the same across the board. Now, if there is any measure of the effectiveness of a measure which is designed to protect teeth, that which keeps teeth in your mouth certainly is the final payoff. Very much the way mortality rates are the final payoff in anything designed to control, say, smallpox. And this is the sort of thing that we find wherever we go. Whether or not there is adequate dental care, there is a tendency for the lost tooth rate to be much lower in populations up through young middle age. Young middle age. I must point that out because I'm thinking, for example, of the findings that I did not show you in Lebanon, where dental caries is approximately, oh, at a third the level of that seen in people of the same ages in this country, but where people become edentulous at about the same rate and where the DMF finding is about the same at age 50 or 55, because of loss of teeth from periodontal disease. But wherever we can exclude periodontal disease from our considerations, the loss of teeth is sharply limited in the area of, of wherever water, whatever the source, furnishes people with about the optimum intake of fluoride. This has been a very short description of a very variegated picture. But basically, natural fluoride waters have been found time and again to inhibit lifetime dental caries experience by about 60% if you are looking at DMF teeth about 70% if you're looking at caries attack rates, that is the number of new lesions per year per year, without disfiguring modeling and with a persistent inhibition which lasts as nearly as we can determine for the entire lifetime of the person. So at this point, why not go directly to a clinical trial of the effectiveness of this material when added to a study water supply. Why not? There was a very good, large, solid, fat reason why not that we'll take up in our next session. Why, in view of the predictable 
and profound effect that fluoride in a domestic water seemed to have in dental caries in children, why not start immediately to put this stuff into city waters here, 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 and here? As a matter of fact, this thing actually was done. And I think a great deal of the difficulty we have had with the anti-fluoridation movement had its genesis in this rush to use something which was not yet established, certainly as safe. The big reason why people like Dean and others held back from fluoridating a community water supply on the basis of the evidence of the 21 cities and other studies of that sort, which by and large were pretty much in the bag by 1938, was this. It was not known whether such a procedure would be safe for the people who used the water with one or say one and a half parts per million of fluoride every day. Now a great deal was known about the <clears throat> upper limits of toxicity from such work as that of Rohom that I have mentioned. <clears throat> but in 1938, very little was known about the effects of small amounts, amounts on the order of one part per million in water, perhaps three milligrams per day in water and food, and being the sort of people that they were, Dean nor none of his co-workers ever really considered fluoridating a, an actual city supply until it could be established that there was little or no danger to the peoples involved. One of the constraints upon research with human beings is that you may not do anything damaging to human subjects. And this is one of the reasons why some of the studies of dental caries, which involve inoculation of individuals with cariogenic organisms, are not being carried out in these United States. But the question was moot. And Frank McClure, whose book was circulated uh, among you last hour, was one of the pioneers in going out to see what might happen to people in fluoride areas as opposed to people who do, did not in, the, in that day live in fluoride areas. And there was a very considerable lapse in time between about 1938 or thereabouts when these studies appeared in print and 1945 when the first study cities received fluoride in their water. Now if I may jump to the end of the chapter, I'm sure none of you reading a detective story would ever think of reading the last chapter first, that would be cheating. But since cheating is the prerogative of the instructor, let's go to the back of the book and look at what we now know about the physiology of fluorides. Were we to rewrite the chapters in Young and Striffler, I am quite certain we would make considerable use of this report gotten together by a committee of people on behalf of the World Health Organization, which includes, I think, everything which is known about fluorides and human physiology. Or in the course of the fluoridation controversy, several judges have been required to write textbooks on the physiology of fluorides in their opinions at the end of one suit or another contesting fluoridation. And one of the best of these, and this 
report, this opinion, I think, is in the file in the dental department. <clears throat> Was that set out by the Honorable M.P. Crisp, the Royal Commissioner of Tasmania, into the fluoridation of public water supplies, which was published by the government printer in Hobart in 1968. It runs to 265 pages. It is typical, although it is one of the most complete and most accurate and most lucid of these judgments, it is typical of the sort of thing that judges have had to do to find against individuals suing to prohibit the fluoridation of a water supply. About two weeks ago, <clears throat> I read an Associated Press account of the adoption of fluoridation in Los Angeles by a vote of the city council. And this report said something to the effect that the expected opposition to this action did not materialize in Los Angeles. Perhaps the steam is going out of the anti-fluoridation movement. Certainly some of its sources of money have dried up. In the wake of a trial, something like that in Tasmania, which was carried out in Dublin, in which an innocent little housewife contest, contested a law which would require fluoridation in all of Ireland's uh, water supplies. And the judge, after a three months trial, after the appearance of essentially every known active anti-fluoridationist in the world, found against this little housewife and assessed her the costs of the trial. I've been trying to find out what those costs amounted to. The least uh, estimate I have heard is $250,000. The highest one is $600,000. The last time I was in Ireland, I learned it had not yet been paid. And perhaps this is post hoc reasoning, perhaps the error of after the fact, therefore because of, but since that time, there has been less money available for the anti-fluoridation battle. Nonetheless, you can still get in a very uncomfortable situation. This happened to me a few weeks ago. My wife and I were invited to a Sunday brunch by a couple. Another couple asked me what I'd been doing all my life. I told them that I had been principally involved in things like the study of fluoride and dental caries. And mine host started in on me. I did the thing that you should never do in public health or public relations. I finally got up and walked out. I'm not used to whiskey sours on an empty stomach before breakfast, but it may have been the reason. But you are going to find, you especially in public health, questions coming up as to the safety of fluoride and human physiology. And you owe a real obligation, not to the John Bircher type whose opinions can't be changed, but to the honest parent usually in the middle who hears this sort of thing and wants to know what the truth is. Which brings us back to Frank McClure. Now the things that were known about the physiology of fluorides back in the early 30s when it began to look as though this thing might have value actually, I think, started with Rollholm. And there's a very brief description of Rollholm's findings in your Young and Striffler. But he was working with cryolite workers, you'll recall, who had been breathing fluoride dust in. Fluoride dust. By that route, they had been 
receiving amounts of fluoride five to 20 times that which can be had from a controlled level of fluoride in domestic water for up to 20 years. And some of them, but not all of them, showed a chronic intoxication, was Rome's term, in which there were exostoses in bone and a very peculiar stiffening of, oh, the spine, for example, of uh, this has been going on at this point about 11 minutes. If you had been one of Roholm's people and had been sitting in a chair for 11 minutes, it might take you 11 more minutes to get back to an upright position from your sitting posture. And there were various other things described by Roholm, and subsequent uh, research has shown that they were in fact due to fluoride exposure. But some of his people had had this Tremendous, massive overdose every day, every working day, for as long as 31 years, I note here. And then there was the matter of cattle. I mentioned the sheep of Morocco. Cattle grazing in the vicinity of a plant producing phosphate fertilizers are quite apt to get a great ingestion of a fluoride-bearing dust. And in this case, cattle were known to have extreme, sometimes, loss of strength in long bones, fractures. And then, of course, the studies following Roholm attempting to find the lethal dose in animals had shown that death was usually due to acute damage to the kidney, the glomeruli of the kidney. So McClure, who was only one of the many people investigating this general proposition, had this much to start with. If there is really damage to human beings from fluoride ingestion at these small amounts, it will probably parallel that seen in acute intoxications and will probably be shown either with damage to kidney function or to some sort of aberration of bone, loss of strength, exostoses, whatever. Now, a priori, this seemed like something that didn't need to be emphasized. With the discovery of small amounts of fluoride in water, and after Willard and Winters, almost everybody tested his drinking water to see whether it contained fluoride and how much. The rather startling discovery was made, startling at that time at least, that almost all drinking water contained fluoride. And if we accept the general theory that life started in the sea and somehow came ashore, we must then postulate some sort of mechanism for at least uh, living and procreating in an environment of fluoride because all seawater contains fluoride up to 1.4, 1.5 parts per million. So that a mechanism which couldn't cope with this thing in its ambience would certainly never have survived. So, McClure went out single-handed in anything but a blaze of publicity because by this time the first uh, emphasis on the first worry, I think, was pretty much dulled. But McClure went out and looked at fracture experience in young men. And the study that you've been asked to read had to do with the fracture experience in young draftees who were being inducted into the armed services prior to World War II. And you will have read of the utter lack of relationship 
the utter lack of relationship between fluoride and the waters of the communities whence these people came and their experience with bone fractures. Rather interestingly, a theory has been developed and I think rather gone into oblivion again that fluoride somehow inhibits osteoporosis and should have the logical effect of reducing fractures in elderly people, women particularly, so often fatal when they fall and break a, the uh, thigh bones, <clears throat> bone. But be that as it may, <clears throat> this thing, nor nothing else, seemed to show up in the bone history of these people. Something you have not read, I think, had to do with the growth and development of the growth centers in the wrist of children. McClure and his associates shot thousands of wrists and looked at the development of the growth centers there, again against fluoride in the water, and found no pattern whatsoever relating to fluoride. <clears throat> he did something else with these young men who were about to be inducted All had your analyses on record. Some of you have been through this and know what I'm talking about. But there was no relation again between fluoride ingestion or exposure and the sort of thing that turns up in the routine urinalysis. Albumin in urine, casts, any of the other indication of infection or of lack of function. <clears throat> And he went on to carry out with himself and a few young people studies of elimination of fluoride and found out that up to about five parts per million on a person who has achieved stability, about the same amount of fluoride is excreted in urine in terms of parts per million as is ingested by mouth. Now that does not mean that all fluoride that goes into the mouth comes out as urine. But there is this very useful correspondence between parts per million in urine and parts per million in water that gives you a very quick and useful check sometimes in a new population, such as those receiving fluoride and salt in Central America to determine whether actually the amount of fluoride that you are talking about is getting to the people concerned. So this was the genesis, I think, the germ of the thing which we now know to be true and which can be described at least by analogy as the flywheel effect. When we get fluoride of any amount, a small amount at one part per million, a rather large amount, it disappears rather quickly, depending on the amount within hours. And not all of this high dose, if it's a high dose, has been excreted by the urine simply has disappeared somewhere. And we now know that it is simply deposited in the inorganic portion of bone very much as though nature needed this fluoride and is putting it on a shelf somewhere for withdrawal when needed because that is exactly what happens. Another analogy perhaps is the feast or famine. Wolves and our own ancestors used to gorge themselves one day against the probability that there would be nothing to eat the day following or the day following that. Now this implies something else, namely that we have not only the ability to live with ambient fluoride, but to take care of ourselves on those occasions when we take in a great deal more than we need today. 
And this too turns out to be true. At any rate, whenever fluoride makes its appearance in great amounts, as for example, when a person moves from a fluoride-free area to a place like Bartlett, Texas, at eight parts per million, There is a very considerable accumulation of fluoride in the inorganic portion of bone, not the living part, the mineral matrix. Matrix is the wrong term, but the matrix or the mineral substance. When a person moves away or discontinues or moves away from a place like Bartlett or discontinues the use of a high fluoride water, and excessive fluoride continues to appear in the urine for up to 20 months. At least that's what we saw at Bartlett when the water was defluoridated there. And this may have something to do, and I'm giving you now some speculation which should be accepted as speculation. This may have something to do with the apparent need for a small moiety of fluoride in blood serum A moiety which was not even suspected as a factor up to perhaps 10 years ago when Harold Hodge decided to try fluoride analyses by tearing a molecule down to its constituents. Now up to that time, all of the analyses for fluoride had been analyses for fluoride in ionic form. And these analyses were interfered with by a number of substances, alumina, sulfates, but in the case of organic fluids, by albumin. And when Harold Hodge did this sort of thing, he came up with a regular difference between his findings and those of Armstrong's for fluoride in serum amounting to four one hundredths of a part per million. Not much, but consistent. It now turns out that this is a definite part of blood serum which probably has a physiological need. This, it seems to me, and remember I'm speculating at this point, this, it seems to me, adds a little more weight to the idea that fluoride is a necessary thing. But at any rate, because of what I have chosen to call the flywheel effect, fluoride in blood varies very little between the high fluoride area and the low fluoride area. There is some small fluctuation which, despite the fact that it's within the error of determination, does seem to be constant from place to place, having to do with the amount of fluoride in the community water. Which leads us, of course, to the question of fluoride in milk. And fluoride in cow's milk, fluoride in human milk, fluoride in the milk of uh, dogs remains remarkably constant regardless of the amount of fluoride ingested by the mother. Fluoride in plants remains remarkably constant regardless of fluoride in the soil in which the plants are grown. All of these things seem to seem consistent, seem to add up to the idea that whether or not we need that moiety of fluoride and serum or not, we are perfectly adjusted to life under conditions where about so much fluoride within rather wide limits is ingested essentially every day. Now these are sidelights. There isn't time this term to go into the physiology of fluoride, you'd have to memorize the WHO book as a starter to get into this sort of thing. 
but I have yet to see any acceptable scientific evidence that anyone has actually ever been hurt, hurt by ingestion of fluoride at the levels recommended for water supplies. What is the optimum fluoride concentration in water? That depends. One of the areas, one of the little towns where everybody 20 years of age or younger had at least moderate or severe fluorosis was a little town in El Salvador called Osotlan. There was a single source of water which came down. This was on the Pacific Slope, on the volcanic slope of the uh, coast there. And the water was piped down from a volcanic source about uh, 3,000 feet up the hill and discharged into the central fountain that you all know if you've worked in Central South America. And it contained 2.8 part, 2 parts per million of fluoride, and it always produced at least moderate and sometimes severe fluorosis. Well, what was the reason? Again, any of you who have worked in Central America know that this uh, uh, <laughs> stupid thing we have of the Mexican or the South American with a big sombrero sleeping in the daylight is not true of some of the hardest working people in the world. They may, uh, they may take a siesta during the hot part of the day, but they're out there at 3 o'clock in the morning working those fields, and the children start right with them. And uh, by trying to equate their water intake with some studies of water intake of Navy engineers working at ambient temperatures of around 130 in World War II, I'm inclined to say that 2.8 parts per million in Osatlan is something the equivalent of about 30 parts per million of fluoride in a town like Ann Arbor. So in optimizing fluoride levels in a community, we must look at, at the amount of water people actually use. And we can get at that only indirectly when we look at climate. Now, you and I live in an artificial climate most of our lives. Today, the temperature outside is around 45 degrees, but none of us is wearing an overcoat. At another time of year, the temperature outside might be 110 degrees, but we would still be existing in our artificial climate here at 68 or 70 or 72. So when we look at temperature and climate, we are looking only indirectly at the thing we would like to know, and that is how much water is actually being consumed by these people. I think that probably, if I'm not departing too far from the central theme here, is one of the reasons why we see less fluorosis in white than in black children living in the same communities I think the answer probably is fluid milk, which supplies a great deal of the water needs of the white children, not so much of the water needs of the black children. Remembering again recent findings that a certain rather large fraction of black children are unable to metabolize some of the elements in milk and will not drink it, even if it's available to them without cost. So with some of these things in mind, Why, why this opposition to the fluoridation of waters, which uh, certainly up to now has been a virulent thing, an emotional thing, a cause that people swear they would be willing to die for, a cause that they're willing to adduce almost any kind of argument contra, and I think that if you have read of Neil's The Fight for Fluoridation, 
you may have an idea how this got started. I'm thinking of chapter 3 in that book, and I would recommend that you go back and read that one again. Those of you who have read it will recall that this deals with World War II and its time in Wisconsin, when a man named Frisch became obsessed with the idea that dental caries must be vanquished and fluoride is the way. Frisch in World War II times coined a phrase 50 by 50. And the meaning of this particular slogan was that we shall have 50 cities fluoridating their domestic waters in Wisconsin by the year 50, 1950. And Frisch went up and down Wisconsin preaching this thing. And he seems to have had a peculiar talent, which fortunately is not a very common talent. But apparently, Frisch was unable to talk to any audience more than five minutes without having at least a quarter of that audience hating his very existence. He was the sort of person who drew opposition. But regardless of that, he was advocating this thing at a time five, six years before the fluoride studies in Grand Rapids, other places were commenced, at a time when most authorities in this field were saying we must wait, first of all, for findings on safety, secondly, for findings on efficacy when the thing is added, Frisch wasn't going to wait. There was no time to lose. And the thing that really set off the bonfire, too tame a term, bonfire, conflagration, occurred in Madison, where Frisch actually succeeded in getting his city council, this was in 1945, to approve fluoridation of Madison's water. But there were some conservative councilmen who weren't at all sure this was a wise thing to do. And they quietly, and uh, quite intelligently, let me say, began to write to various authorities saying, what will happen if we permit this thing to go into effect in our city, in Madison? And they got an answer back from one uh, quite respected nutritionist saying, uh, why it's silly to fluoridate water we can control dental caries and rats much better with milk than we can with one part per million of fluoride. I find it hard to believe that this man didn't know that studies with rats require 50 parts per million of fluoride to produce the same effect as one part in humans. But then most of the answers that came back came back from men who were honestly and sincerely doubtful whether safety of this measure had ever been established. As a result of this sort of thing in its publication, fluoridation in Madison was delayed five years until 1950. But essentially every argument you have heard from an antifluoridationist was developed during that period of five years and very little has been added since that time. Nothing of importance. What should this tell you and me? Well, first of all, that it's, I think, that it's a little bit dangerous to wave the flag until we're quite certain what the inscription on the flag stands for. Jumping the gun can be just as damaging to your public health campaign as failure to press it after your facts are in. Had I been approached in Wisconsin in the late 40s, I would have said it is premature to fluoridate your city water. I was, in fact, so approached in South Dakota at that time and did, in fact, say that thing and I helped, heard it coming back to me for the next 15 years. 
Fluoridation is premature. But if anything, there has been this, if there has been anything of value in it, there has been this thing that can be said, I think. My father was a tinsmith back in the days when you didn't go down to the dime store to buy things. He was an expert at trigonometry. He used to make his own patterns. And I used to help him, not knowing what was going on here, really. But when he made a pail, for example, he made it very carefully according to his pattern. But he didn't put that thing on the counter to be sold until he did what? Sure. Filled it with water to see if it leaked. Now, this opposition to fluoridation, which began, by the way, with the doubts of some well-informed in good men, I think has brought up as a suggestion every possibility of whatever might have gone wrong. The people who opposed it in all good faith at the outset, I think, brought every objection, including some utterly and completely screwball. So that these objections could be checked out, and they were checked out. And people like myself can come to you today and say, after all this experience, I or we have yet to see a case established where one part per million of fluoride has hurt anybody. This thing has had the most exhaustive study of any public health measure which was ever suggested in the history of medicine or dentistry or what have you. And it's come out with flying colors. Perhaps this now is ancient history. I hope that's true. We know a great deal about the physiology, which probably would be of very little interest. We know a great deal about the safety. We know a great deal about the application of the thing in large communities where it's essentially foolproof and the problem has been sometimes scarcity of fluorides. We have been alerted to the occasional accidents such as Dr. Park has uncovered, where in a school fluoridation system, the fluoridator continued to work when the water intake did not. We've learned how to manage this thing. And you who go out to advocate this thing for small cities can do so not only with a feeling of complete confidence that you're right, but in the absolute assurance that when you do this, you're going to help people. I would not use arguments that aren't fully substantiated. I would not, for example, bring up the idea of stupedial deafness as being inhibited by fluoride. This may not be true. This is, could possibly, in fact, I think, probably be another post hoc finding of an association which is not dependable and does not stand up. Fluoride uh, therapy for osteoporosis has largely been dropped although it has contributed further evidence as to the safety of fluoride, patients treated for osteoporosis have received up to, uh, and I'm trying to recall a figure which may be uh, incorrect, a highly exaggerated daily dosage of fluoride for periods of six or eight months and have shown no adverse reaction. Some of the difficulties that have been ascribed to uh, Fluoride in kidney treatments are more probably due to an infection of the filter used in the effluent system. At least this has been shown in certain places in Minnesota, and so on and so on. Although let it be said now that the dialysis machine should contain water essentially free of all electrolytes and not just fluoride. I wouldn't. Uh, 
I wouldn't bear down on the idea that atherosclerosis is lessened in the fluoride area, although this has been found in some. I would get back to the thing that we can justify up to the hilt on the basis of solid evidence that this thing doesn't hurt anybody, that it produces this profound, this profound inhibition of dental caries. You've been listening to a presentation from the University of Michigan School of Dentistry, which is dedicated to supporting open learning and open educational resources. This recording is licensed under the Creative Commons. It may be reused and redistributed for nonprofit use. Please attribute materials to the University of Michigan School of Dentistry and redistribute under this same license. For more information on how this and other University of Michigan School of Dentistry recordings may be used, visit www.dent.umich.edu license.